this game would be pretty good if it didn't suck so much. True, and yeah, that's pretty true. That's true, and yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's pretty true. That's pretty true. I mean, hey, so sorry for this video taking a little bit longer to come out than I initially thought. There were honestly a couple of reasons for that. So first off, with a game as uniquely structured as GTA Online, it was honestly kind of difficult being able to show off a lot of the content here since it either requires a higher upfront cost or a lot of grinding to access the majority of available missions and scenarios. And with some of the game modes requiring a certain amount of players to participate, it did require me to put in a little bit of work to find time to schedule other people to hop into a session with me to get footage since finding other players who wanted to participate in the same activity in GTA Online is honestly like pulling teeth. With a game as big and with as wide of a net of available content, I wanted to try to experience at least most of it before making a video. But there was also one other reason why this video took me a little bit longer to finish. Can you guys really blame me for wanting to play Shadow of the Erd Tree over GTA Online? Really? But hey, we're back for the finale of our GTA Marathon, so without further ado, let's hop into it. So Grand Theft Auto Online is a bit of a weird one to talk about, isn't it? Initially, the scope of this game was to be a little bit more of an expanded version of the multiplayer elements that we saw back in Grand Theft Auto 4, but obviously this has evolved into a completely different beast entirely. Now, multiplayer has been in the Grand Theft Auto series for really as far back as the first game. In fact, the only mainline GTA game to not have a multiplayer feature was Vice City back on the PS2. So it's really not that big of a surprise to see that the version that we got in Grand Theft Auto 5 was the biggest yet, but I don't even think Rockstar themselves could have anticipated just how much of a monster that this game would become. GTA Online has been a massive success for Rockstar, extending the game's life over a decade after its initial release, spanning three whole console generations, constantly remaining as one of the most played games no matter what platform it was released on, and one has to wonder how much of that $8 billion revenue that GTA 5 brought in was thanks to the shark card system. We'll talk about that. I first experienced GTA Online during its launch on the PS3 way back in the far off year of 2013. Being 17 at the time, having just finished the campaign, and having a bunch of friends who wanted to play the multiplayer, this was a prime time to experience the game. I remember logging so many hours in this game in the early days, exploring the streets of Los Santos with my friends, customizing my character to look like Roman Reigns from The Shield, and doing a ton of races and missions. And I mean, a ton of races and missions. And you know, that's kind of all I remember about this game too, to be honest. Okay, I do have a couple of specific memories of doing stuff with my friends. I remember we had a contest to see who could push each other off one of the cranes first. I remember using the door glitch for the tattoo shops to essentially launch cars across the map. And I remember the race that took place across the entire perimeter of the island that we decided to do on lawnmowers. It may have taken about an hour or so to finish that race, and there wasn't a single time that I think anyone got past, but shit, that was something I don't think I will ever forget. Well, okay, there was one other thing that I remember. Everything in the game was super expensive, and the payouts that you got from missions were incredibly small. Keep in mind, I initially played this game at launch, and to say that it was a bare bones experience would be a pretty big understatement. This game launched with no heists, no content creator, and the only properties you could buy were garages and apartments. This meant that there was a severe lack of ways to make money, and an even more severe lack of things to spend that money on. After I initially grinded to get the most expensive apartment in the game, there really wasn't much else to do. The content creator was eventually put into the game, and I had some fun with that for a while, but that wasn't enough to really tie me over until I got to experience the content that I really wanted to see, which was the heists. And we wouldn't even see those until the game saw its release on the PS4 and Xbox One, which was nearly a year and a half after the initial release. So yeah, I got bored of this game and moved on to some other things. Over the next few years, I would see bits and pieces of new content dropping for GTA Online, but I never really had the itch to go back, you know? I saw the heist release, thought it was cool, and didn't really think much else of it. Same goes for the business building. Nice addition, but since I didn't know anyone else playing GTA Online, it wasn't enough to convince me to go back. Over the years, I saw the reception of this game change in a couple of different ways. I saw the RP scene blow up that while somewhat entertaining to watch, I didn't find too interesting myself. I saw the integration of GTA stunt clips added to videos to help the zoomer brain stim out and to not lose focus like it was some Subway Surfers gameplay. But the thing I saw the most was just how much people seem to rag on this game now. I'm not kidding you, people fucking hate GTA Online. I have not seen so many people have a vitriolic reaction to a game that wasn't League of Legends or Overwatch 2. And if I'm bringing up those two games, you know it's not good. I heard so many stories about how egregious the microtransactions were, how bad the issues with hackers was, and just what a vapid and depressing cesspool the game has become, and above all else, how this game has basically destroyed the franchise to many people's minds. Now doesn't that get you excited for a review? 
And not to disappoint you guys or anything, but I honestly don't really have the total disgust that a lot of people have for this game. Don't get me wrong, in a lot of ways this game sucks. Like, it sucks so fucking hard. But I didn't walk away really hating my time with this one. In fact, I actually had a good amount of fun with it, and I thought it was really interesting to see how much the game has changed since I last played it 10 years ago. So does that mean I like this game and I can recommend it to you? No. No, I wouldn't say that. Rather, I just think the game is sort of okay enough that maybe some of the flack that the game gets is a bit unwarranted, because there really is still some fun to be had. But we'll get into that as we go on. We've got a lot to talk about today. So without further ado, this is my review for Grand Theft Auto Online. So I've looked at a number of different types of games during my time on YouTube. I've looked at RPGs, FPSs, roguelites, single player games, multiplayer games. But one thing that I've never actually looked at was an MMO. That's not too surprising since MMOs are typically very long, have a ton of content to experience, and if I'm being honest with you guys, aren't exactly my cup of tea except if you, like, you know, ignore the 500 hours I have in Final Fantasy XIV. Looking forward to Dawn Trail, by the way. And yeah, what a way to break into the MMO conversation, not with talking about Final Fantasy XIV or World of Warcraft or fucking runescape, but with Grand Theft Auto Online. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, this game is basically an MMO, or it's at least very heavily influenced by them. Typically when people hear MMO, they think of the MMO RPGs that I mentioned earlier, but within the past 10 years or so, a lot of releases have come out that have really pushed the MMO boundary and fused them with a number of different gaming genres, especially shooters with games like Destiny, Warframe, Rust, DayZ, Escape from Tarkov, and Fallout 76 leading the charge. And yeah, that's not exactly the most inspiring roster of games that you've ever heard of, especially when you consider that Grand Theft Auto Online fits into that same category, but you guys get my point. So what is it that actually makes this game an MMO? Because at first glance, it kind of just looks like your standard GTA game with some extra assholes running around the city. Which I mean, general gameplay wise, yeah, it's basically 99% the same as Grand Theft Auto V, but there are a number of other changes here too. Running down the list real quick, we have the higher player count in a shared world. We have interactions with other players. We have instant segments of gameplay. We have daily and weekly challenges. And lastly, we have open zone activities. Now, some of these aspects are pretty in line with what you would expect from other MMOs, such as Destiny or Final Fantasy XIV, but others just kind of leave your head scratching as to how poorly implemented they are. I'll be comparing GTA Online to those games the most, since they are two MMO-like games that I have the most experience with, and they have a number of very similar elements to consider. So with that being said, let's jump into a few of these topics. Now, this might be a shock to you guys, but Grand Theft Auto Online is an always online game. I know, I couldn't believe it either. When you first load in, which currently might hold the record for the longest loading times out of any AAA game today, you can be put into one of three different types of lobbies. These will all be on the same map that we had in base GTA 5, but now you'll have the chance to explore the island with friends. You can visit each other's living spaces, go to public events together, show off your cars or clothes, you know, typical MMO stuff. You'll also have the option to be in a server with your friends or crewmates, a private server that you can choose to invite people to, or a public lobby. For the most part, you can do a lot of the same activities in whichever choice you pick, with some exclusive stuff only being allowed to be done in public lobbies. Which begs the question, why don't you just play in a public lobby all the time? Well, oh boy, let me answer that question with a question. If you played a Grand Theft Auto game before, and you've seen all the crazy shit that you do, all the stunts that you perform, and all the people that you killed, what do you think that experience is like when you have 29 other people who are just like you, and PvP is always enabled? It's chaos, complete and utter fucking chaos. Your only reprieve from the madness is by having a solo session, an invite-only lobby, or enabling this passive mode which prevents you from being killed, but you are also quite restricted yourself and can't fire weapons. But again, you do those things and you can't participate in a number of activities that GTA Online has, so you often have no choice but to engage in the public lobbies with other players, which brings me to the community. And this community is just... It's just fucking awful. You got people who are literally no help on missions, AFKers, tons of bots spamming garbage in all chat, people begging for free money, probably the most uninteresting and least engaging people when it comes to communicating in a lobby in general, to be honest, but the two big problems are with the griefers and hackers. Now with the griefers, I get it. They're still super fucking annoying, but I get where they're coming from. These are the guys that will be in a tank and try to shoot you and your friends while you're doing an open world activity, or the people who will wait outside your property and try to kill you when you come out, 
or the assholes who have giant trucks that will just corner the fuck out of you and stop you from playing, or the pieces of shit with their stupid fucking oppressors. They're annoying, but are kind of a part of the game's weird charm in a way. Like, this is supposed to be a crime-ridden hellscape, so of course you're gonna have some assholes fucking with you. In fact, for some of the challenges, I think it can actually be kind of exhilarating to try to do one of the open world activities while another player is trying to kill you. It kind of gives me some extraction shooter vibes like Hunt Showdown or something, and that's its own sort of experience, so I don't mind it too much. There really isn't that much of an incentive to go out of your way to kill other players anyway, so it's not as common as you might think. Like, if you kill someone, you'll maybe get a couple hundred bucks and some ammo, but you'll also start to get a little icon on the map that might as well say, I'm a fucking cunt, that will let people know to stay away from you. There's definitely some incentive for being a good player and not doing this stuff, like getting an extra two grand every once in a while, or being able to look at yourself in the mirror and be proud, but I wouldn't say it's exactly enough to sway most people's actions. If these type of things are a deal breaker for you, just stay away, because it will most certainly happen at some point unless you exclusively play private sessions. The other issue, which I think is way less okay, are the hackers. I can say this without exaggeration, outside of the few private sessions I hosted, I don't think I was in a single lobby where there wasn't at least one person that was hacking. Now sometimes it wasn't too bad. There were hackers that would pop in, boost everyone's level, get them a little bit of cash, give them some weapons to temporarily play with, and dip. Those guys are fine. I even had one guy teleport into my car to kill off a bunch of people that were chasing me as I was transporting cargo and offered to help me out. So that was cool of them. More often than not, hackers completely ruined the game for everyone. I saw people camp objectives with pistols that shot explosive rounds that would instantly kill anyone close by. I had one guy completely disable player abilities to drive or to shoot. Yeah, that was fucking cringe. I had one guy with god mode take the objective I was after and then fly in the sky and continuously kill me so I couldn't finish what I set out to do. I had one guy with god mode on in the mission on the enemy team that kept killing my teammates until I got into a vehicle and continuously ran him over, essentially stun locking him for the rest of the game. Yeah, it's pretty fucking bad. And the kick system requires a large number of players to actually participate in kicking these cheaters, so you know that didn't fucking happen. So your only real solution is to hop lobbies until you find something that is actually bearable. It's remarkable to me that a game that's this popular, that's made this much money, has such a shitty moderating system that they don't pick up on this sort of stuff. Now outside of the shitty community, let's talk about engaging with your friends in Grand Theft Auto Online, because no matter what I say, playing this game with friends is actually pretty fun. Much like many MMO games, you can form this game's version of a guild or a free company, just being called a crew this time around. This will allow you to join sessions made up entirely of people in the same crew, which will give you a small RP bonus. There's ranks within the crew as well to give different levels permission, there's crew emblems, so pretty standard stuff there. What isn't standard is the lack of a party feature, which is just kind of a mind-boggling thing to not have, right? There is something sort of like a party up feature if you register as a CEO or MC president, where you can invite other players to join your organization, which is about as close to a party system as there exists. You can disable friendly fire, always see each other on the map, allow them to use your vehicles, do exclusive missions, have matching outfits, and they can help you participate in some open world activities. The only problem with that is that they're locked behind their own certain buildings, which either means a lot of grinding or paying for some currency to skip straight to it. We'll talk about that soon, don't worry. Strangely enough, that party system also doesn't pull you guys back into the same lobby when you guys finish a mission. And when you're entering a mission, it doesn't automatically invite people to those either. Which yeah, that's sort of a weird one to get into. Later on in the video, I'll talk about the actual contents of the missions themselves, but first I want to talk about how much of a clusterfuck it is to actually just get into one in the first place. So when you find a job that you want to do, whether that be a standard mission, a race, a deathmatch, a heist, or whatever, you get brought to this lobby screen. Now here you can do a number of things such as buy ammo and invite other players while you wait for the mission to start. If you're not the host, you can even continue to do open world activities while you wait, which is sort of nice. The problem comes with the fact that certain missions will have player count requirements in order to begin. This is mainly attributed to the older content that can occasionally require two to four players in order to even start these missions in the first place. So if you got three other friends, you can usually work this out no problem. If you don't, good fucking luck getting anything done. You're going to have to play with randoms, and for how demanding some of the more challenging missions can be such as the early heists, I wouldn't recommend wasting your time. They rarely communicate, they'll often leave causing the mission to completely wipe, just don't do it unless you have a full party. That's assuming that you could even get a random to join you in the first place, since that's its own form of challenge. There is a system for inviting people to your instance mission from your lobby, your friend list, your crew, or even matchmaking for your skill level, but none of that really matters too much. Players will get a pop-up that you're looking for other people to play with, and 9 times out of 10 will completely ignore your quest, and I mean, why shouldn't they? You don't get any incentives for helping out other players like you do with any other MMO. 
It's not like Final Fantasy XIV where the daily roulettes give increased rewards for helping players clear old content. It's not like Destiny 2 where a lot of the most efficient ways of completing challenges is to run strikes. And it's not like Warframe where certain missions will have particular things that drop for you to use in your builds. In fact, joining another player's mission more than likely has you losing potential money that you could be earning elsewhere. Thankfully, the more recent updates allow for most activities to be done solo, but there is still a high amount of content that requires a full lobby for, and it's simply not worth all the trouble unless you have a group that can actually do it with you. The only other thing that might convince them to join would be whatever challenges they have left to complete, which I mean, again, are kind of doubtful since there are probably more efficient uses of their time to complete them if you go out of your way to do them at all. Now, stuff like spinning the wheel at the casino or going for Gerald's loot stashes, always fun. But a lot of the other daily challenges are kind of a toss up between completing them unintentionally while you do other things or they are locked behind some non-solo play, which you're less likely to be doing. So if it sounds like this game is kind of shit the bed in every aspect that makes up a decent MMO, it's because it has. But there is one thing that I will say that this game does legitimately well, and that it's its open world events and missions. I talked a little bit earlier about how other players might try to grief you when you're doing cargo runs, and you can't really do these in private sessions, but honestly, I think these make for some of the most fun moments that you can have in Grand Theft Auto Online, especially if you have some friends to watch your back. Strategizing how you want to navigate the city, planning out the best route and vehicle to take, all the while avoiding the mentally unstable players trying to kill you, it's very extraction shooter-esque. There are a number of these missions to do, and with the big risk reward factor to them, I think there's a lot of fun to be had. The world events are also pretty damn fun. Sometimes there'll be a random warehouse that needs to be raided. Sometimes you'll have this King of the Castle style minigame where you have to hold down a certain area for points. And sometimes there's just little challenges to see who can touch the most checkpoints, do the longest wheelie, or perform the longest jump. I honestly really enjoy these for as basic as they are, since they do kind of spice up the standard open world spelunking that you and your friends are probably doing. So yeah, overall not the greatest implementation of a lot of MMO elements that we see work in other games. And I know Grand Theft Auto Online isn't exactly the same game as Final Fantasy XIV, or Destiny, or Warframe, but they do have a lot of similar systems, and GTA Online shows us what that system might look like if it wasn't implemented as well as it was in those other games. Still fun to experience with friends, no doubt, but the more I played the game, it just seemed like there was like one thing after another that was constantly weighing me down, and honestly, the worst of it came with the new player experience. The MMO new player experience is a very tough thing to nail down. Final Fantasy XIV has an incredibly long run-up to get to the endgame content, requiring all of the expansion's main story scenarios to be completed, which can take several hundred hours of playtime. Destiny 2 has the issue of the first two years of content being completely removed from the game, having players be utterly lost on key story aspects that leave new players confused and uninterested in the current plot. GTA Online has a worse new player experience than both of them. So I know that I'm technically not a new player since I played Grand Theft Auto Online at launch, but given the sheer amount of content that's been added to the game over the past 10 years or so, this might as well be a new game to me. For this video, I started a completely new account on the PC version of this game since my PS3 account has been lost to the sands of time. And let me just say, while I don't have a ton of experience with MMOs, this is not how you introduce a new player to the game. But you hop in, you make your character, I made a methed out Giga Chad version of Dante from Devil May Cry, and are brought to the streets of Los Santos to meet up with Lamar. He gives you a gun and a brief tutorial on the basics of playing a GTA game, and off you go. Now what? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. You are dropped into the open world with a map that is littered with quest markers, and I guess you just go do whatever you want. Okay, sure, that's kind of how early World of Warcraft was. Let's see how that plays out. So you go try to grab a quest, and it's locked by you purchasing a property that is priced at over a million dollars. Okay, well maybe I'll go do this objective. Nope, you need to find some drugs in order to do this, which I have no idea how to get. In fact, the vast majority of quest markers are essentially inaccessible to you unless you already have the property or vehicle required to access them. This won't stop every NPC in the world calling and texting you to do their quests every single time you log in though, which you can see a lot of returning characters like Brucey, Yousef, and Gay Tony all from GTA 4, which I think is cool to see them back, but they're rather unceremoniously implemented that just makes you say, oh, well, I guess they're here now too. So I guess what I'm supposed to do is just grind to get money so I can buy things in order to do these missions. So what's the best way of doing that? Well, running some of the random jobs around honestly gave pretty meager payouts, often capping off around the $20,000 mark, so far below what we're looking for. But eventually, I did find a couple of quest lines I was able to do. And for what it's worth, these were actually pretty good, with a lot of the quest lines harkening back to the vibe of the base game. After finishing one of these quest lines, I still didn't really have enough to afford any of the necessary properties to do anything else. 
I had some money for a couple decent weapons and vehicle upgrades now, but I didn't really know where to go next. What's even my goal here? Seriously, I had no idea what the actual point of anything was. It's not like there's a consistent storyline to follow. Was it really to grind up enough money or purchase some microtransactions just so you can get more content to do later? Well, eventually I caved and grabbed the Criminal Enterprise starter pack. This gave me some cars, some weapons, and cosmetics, but most importantly, a couple of properties that I could use to passively gain income and do activities for some slightly better payouts. If you bought Grand Theft Auto V on PC, chances are you got the version that already comes with this bundled in. I bought this a few years ago and I wasn't as lucky though, so I had to make a separate purchase. This definitely gives a leg up and provides a pretty decent start to get some actual decent grinding going. It's definitely worth getting if you want to get into GTA Online. Now if you're fortunate enough to play this game on the PS5 or an Xbox Series console, you actually get a completely different early game where you are given a choice of what type of business tycoon you wish to be and a small loan of $4 million to get you going. This is honestly really nice as it immediately gets you in the feel for what this game eventually becomes. Now I bet you're wondering why Rockstar didn't implement this start of the game to the PC version as well. This just straight up sucks. When you factor everything I just talked about together, it makes a new player experience confusing since there's no direction on what to actually do, it doesn't do a great job of showcasing what the game eventually becomes since you will more than likely be required to grind out dozens of missions to buy anything, it's inconsistent based on what platform you play the game on or even when you purchase the game in the first place, and it's predatory in the sense that it incentivizes you to purchase the Criminal Enterprise Pack or Shark Card just so you can experience the parts of the game that are actually legitimately fun to play. You combine all of those issues with everything that I mentioned in the previous section of this video, and it just begs the question, why would you even want to get into GTA Online? It just seems like a miserable thing to jump into. This next section of the video, I was actually a little hesitant about throwing in because, well, it's just really a footnote if I'm being honest. So yeah, the story of Grand Theft Auto Online. It exists, we'll just say that. Well, okay, we'll get a little bit more into it. So the story starts out a couple months before the main game of GTA V, with your OC arriving in Los Santos to... make a living, I guess. Your OC takes a silent approach this time around, meaning we've regressed all the way back to how things felt in GTA III. All the side characters do the talking, and your main character stands there and reacts. If you call this reacting. Alright, so our OC is kind of a brick wall. How are the other characters? Well, they're essentially the same as they were in the base game, but since they might as well be having a conversation with themselves, at this point they're supremely less interesting. Some are a little bit better than others, like I think Lester really hasn't lost much in the translation, but Lamar, and especially Trevor, just feel like hollow renditions of themselves. It's almost like when you go to Disney World and you see someone like Mark Hamill on the TV right before a ride, who's in character and telling you about the importance of keeping your seatbelt on. You know who they are and who they're supposed to be portraying, but it just feels like the soul has been sucked out of them, you know? It's not too bad when you have some of the characters interact with each other, like when Gay Tony berates Laszlo, but for the most part, the dialogue is just a lesser version of what we saw in the base game. The way that the events unfold are kind of weird, too. So like I said earlier, some of the game's story takes place slightly before the events of GTA V, but being a live service game, there was obviously a bunch of stuff added over the last decade, story content included. This means that over the course of 10 years or so, we've seen updates that have added new quest lines that take place over the course of this game's lifespan, and while not anything amazing, I think they're mostly fine. We see some new and returning characters, and while nothing here is as close to as entertaining as the base game, I still think there's at least enough here to expand the GTA universe in a fun way. Plus, you got a cameo from Dr. Dre. That's pretty awesome if I do say so myself. Most of the quest lines are pretty much unrelated from one another, so you can kind of pick and choose which ones you want to do at any given time. Overall, it's all right. It's not the most in-depth thing in the world, and if I had to choose, I definitely would have wished we got some single-player story content, but for what it is, this is okay. Another key feature when talking about many MMO games comes with the progression system. And would you believe me if I told you I have some mixed feelings about this too? You would? Okay, well allow me to bitch some more. So progression really comes in three forms. Job points, reputation, and cash. Job points are next to fucking worthless. Essentially being earned per lobby which determines tiebreakers so they basically never come into play. Reputation is basically the experience points of this game. As you complete jobs, do open world quests, get headshots, or finish challenges, you'll get reputation points that will increase your rank. As your rank increases, you have more options for activities to participate in, weapons and vehicles to purchase, and missions to do. These essentially cap out at around level 120, but your level can extend far past that amount. 
This system is fine enough. You can still drive cars or use weapons from higher ranks if you find them somewhere. And you can do higher level missions if they're hosted by another player. The early levels are kind of tedious since you don't have many great options for weapons, but you rank up fast enough that it isn't really too much of a problem. That and with how often hackers are in your lobby boosting you, you may as well throw the progression system completely out the window. Now, when it comes to GTA Online, Cash is pretty much king because everything that you're going to want to do is paywalled in one way or another. That's not an exaggeration. If you see a property you want, cash. You find some new clothes that look good, cash. Vehicle you want to try out, cash. Weapon you want to use, cash. And a lot of it. $300 for a broken bottle. Who runs this fucking economy? And a lot of the things that you might want to buy actually do look kind of cool, so they're pretty tempting. There are a bunch of different apartments to purchase, and a ton, and I mean a ton of different vehicles of all types, many exclusive to GTA Online. Same going for weapons, and don't even get me started on the clothing. You can essentially cater your style to whatever you want with how robust the customization options are for your clothing, which is pretty damn remarkable. So with money constantly being needed to do the majority of things that Grand Theft Auto Online has to provide, you might be asking yourself, what's the fastest way to earn money? And the answer is quite simple. Go get a real world job and buy shark cards. <laughs> No, seriously, if you really wanted to earn the most money possible, the most efficient way would be for you to just go work an hour at your real life job and plan on spending that money on a shark card since you'll receive the biggest payout for your time, even if you aren't actually playing the game. But let's assume that you at least have a little bit of dignity left and you don't want to make another donation to the multi-billion dollar corporation. Well, congratulations, you get to grind. Now your mileage is going to vary greatly on how much this bothers you. Some people don't mind running the same mission, open world activity, business venture, or heist over and over again. And for those people, that's awesome. There are a number of pretty decent money making opportunities for you to try out. And if you're able to get some friends in on the action, it's even better. If that grind sounds uninteresting to you, I just wouldn't play this game to be honest. Now, thankfully, Rockstar has made this grind engaging both in terms of how interesting and varied it can be, as well as giving decent enough payouts. So much so that I don't think you really need to spend money on shark cards if you don't want to. Assuming you don't have the means to start with a business, you're going to have to grind missions, which definitely do suck, since you're probably going to need to finish around 50 or so to be able to afford a property worth a shit. After you get a certain amount of money, grabbing certain businesses that open up new money-making possibilities is the way to go. There are around 10 or so different property types that fit this bill, with some of them such as the nightclubs and motorcycle clubhouses offering more of a passive income, while bunkers and offices offer something a little bit more interactive. And then some properties even give you access to the game's heists. I honestly recommend dabbling a little bit with all of these, just to find out which one of these you enjoy the most when it comes to getting those payouts. Personally, I had all the passive properties running so I could make a solid amount of money every hour while I did some of the more active businesses. There was a lot of setup to this, but I'm not going to lie, it was honestly a pretty exhilarating thing to have all of these different businesses operating at the same time. They're all slightly different mechanically speaking, they offer upgrades to the facility, some you can even get some exclusive weapons or vehicles, so I actually did think it was really rewarding going for a few of these. Just the grind to get all of this stuff up and running was so long. I would also recommend going over to the casino to do some gambling if you're feeling lucky, since some of the horse races can give some pretty big payouts too. Which, by the way, remember when I said this in my San Andreas video? Or how come there's no gambling in the casino in GTA 5? Well, actually, seeing as how Rockstar introduced the shark card system, maybe that's for the best. Well, as it turns out, yes, you can buy a shark card to spend money on tokens at the casino, which you can then use to gamble. Don't you just love modern gaming? The heists are where all the real big payouts come from, depending on which one you do, the level of difficulty, and how many players are in each, though. Talking about the heist more specifically is getting into the mission design details, so I'll talk about that in a second, but I'll wrap up this point with this. If you don't mind turning on a podcast or shooting the shit with your friends in Discord while you grind out some money to be able to get the things you actually want, then I think there might be enough here for you. The game relies on your desire as a player to mainly want to collect things such as vehicles, weapons, clothing, and property, which honestly for a lot of people is definitely enough. I can't say it 100% keeps me engaged, but I did find myself willing to grind out a few things in order to get a few of the items I really wanted. Like this submarine base, look at this thing, it's fucking badass. No modifications though, since I would essentially have to take a second mortgage out on the house in order to afford some of these guided missiles, but at the least the process of getting it wasn't as bad as I thought going in. Now a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about so far really hasn't been the greatest, but if there is one thing that GTA Online really gets right, it's the mission design. There are a ton of missions to do in this game, and I mean a ton of fucking missions, look at this shit. With most of the time, I would say that they can actually get pretty close to the level of some of the main missions in GTA 5, and some offer some completely unique experiences. These can essentially be divided up into contact missions, races, competitive game modes, side activities, and heists. 
Starting down the list, we have contact missions. These are essentially your standard missions that you would see in a normal GTA game. You have a couple of objectives to complete. They are often accompanied by NPC dialogue, and a lot of them have subsequent missions to create a semblance of a story. I think these are good for the most part, with the only issue being that many of them have a minimum player requirement and they can't be done solo. Since there is basically no incentive to do them outside of your initial playthrough, you can see why these don't get a whole lot of love. Next up, we have races. These are pretty self-explanatory. You have to race across a course where you have to touch every single checkpoint to advance. You've got some for basically every vehicle type you can think of, but also have a few specialty races that will attempt to see you get the most points from drifting, switch gears successfully, or even have transforming races where you switch into different vehicles. Surprisingly enough, it's not too hard to get people interested in actually playing these, so you can at least somewhat reliably play a race whenever you choose. After that, we have some of the more competitive game modes, which there's a lot to choose from. You've got Deathmatch, Last Team Standing, King of the Hill, a ton of more specialized game modes that really don't get enough attention. I admittedly didn't get to play many of these since there's absolutely no one that wanted to participate. But if you get a larger group of friends, I'd imagine these can be pretty fun. Also, side note, there is also a wave-based survival mode. It doesn't really fit in with any of the other mission types, so I just sort of threw it here. Pretty fun and challenging, and it actually isn't the worst way to make money. After that is the side activities. These you can play very various games with your friends like golf, tennis, blackjack, darts. You probably get the drill for this one. And finally, these are the missions that definitely are the strongest point of GTA Online, the heists. This is essentially the raid equivalent of this game, and I have to say, they really nailed it here. Each of these heists has a setup much like the main game where multiple objectives need to be complete in order to unlock the final mission. For the earlier heists, these were full-on sequence missions, but the later ones would allow a solo player to complete them in free roam. Actually, the same can be said with the final missions themselves. A lot of the older heists required that four players be present, and they would all have to coordinate together to perform their own duties to ensure the heist could be completed. The newer heists are a bit more flexible, allowing for smaller player counts, and even have several different options for how you'd want to play through the scenario, which makes them a lot better to grind out. You can change your entry point, your loadout, if you're getting any support on the mission, there's a lot that you can tweak here. They're all pretty damn challenging too, but definitely offer the best payouts, usually going over $1 million, so they're definitely worth your time doing. I don't really have too many complaints here. These are pretty fucking good. But there's even better news to this. We gotta get into the community creation stuff, which really is kind of the cherry on top when it comes to the mission design. Now, if you guys remember what I said in my Portal 2 video, I said that I wasn't really too much into the creative aspect for games like this, and I just like to play what other people have been making, and Grand Theft Auto Online is kind of the same deal. Yeah, the creation tool is super in-depth with a ton of things to customize for pretty much every game mode you can think of, and holy shit, the amount of community creations is absolutely insane. It's kind of lame that you have to go to Rockstar's website in order to select the ones you want to use in your game, but the amount of fun stuff to find is just ridiculous. I found a survival map where all the NPCs were zombies on a run down bridge. I found a competitive map where one team had a big ass truck and needed to run over the other team trying to dodge them on bikes. I found a bunch of different custom racetracks and deathmatch arenas. There's just a staggering amount of stuff here. So much so that if more of the player base actively engaged with this content more, I would give an easy recommendation for that alone. But the unfortunate reality is you're pretty much only going to be experiencing this content with friends or the occasional stranger who accepts your game invite if you're lucky. Which, yeah, that really sucks, especially for the creators that put a lot of time and energy into making these things. They really deserve to be spotlighted more than they actually are. And credit where credit's due, Rockstar has spotlighted a lot of community creations in the past, so there is always that. So let's wrap things up real quick. Can I recommend Grand Theft Auto Online to you? What? No, man. Ew. No. No. God, no. This game tries to take notes from other successful MMOs, but completely misses some of the basic fundamentals on what makes those games work in the first place. The community, for the most part, completely sucks, especially when it comes to the amount of hackers present in every single lobby. The new player experience is not clear on what you should be doing, and the majority of the content that is worth playing is either walled off by a time or money requirement, or are completely unplayable thanks to them requiring a minimum player limit. I do think it's at least possible to have fun with this game if you have at least three friends that can help you experience most of the content, but even then, it still doesn't fix a number of the issues that I have with this. I definitely had some fun, and I will say I don't think it's by any means god-awful, I can definitely see the appeal and I understand why people like it. However, there are just too many little things that add up to make this game feel like a giant waste of time, or that it's constantly badgering me to spend real world money, which I really don't want to do. It's because of that that I can't really recommend playing this game for everyone. That being said, this game does scratch a weird sort of itch that no other game out there can really get. We don't really have another modern third person MMO game that allows you to have the freedom that GTA Online does, so for the time being, 
setting, this is really the best that we've got. So if you're a person that really does like that setting and doesn't mind the grind, this game honestly could be for you. You could definitely do worse. But I will say, there are definitely better GTA games, better MMOs, and better things to spend your money on than a fucking shark card. Personally, I don't think I'll be coming back to this one. But that's it, we finally made it to the end of our first longer marathon, at least until GTA 6 comes out next year. Which, by the way, I plan on covering that at its launch, so look forward to that. What a ride this has been, I can't believe we're finally at the end. I'm gonna do one final video where I rank all the GTA games I played in a tier list to send off the series before moving on to some other games. And god, there are so many games coming out. I just finished Elden Ring's DLC, by the time this video goes up, Dawn Trail for Final Fantasy XIV will be pretty close to being out, and hey, there was a new Zelda game that was just announced. Which brings me to our next marathon. You guys probably see me make a couple of mentions now, but the next marathon, I'm gonna be covering pretty much every single Legend of Zelda game, all the way from the original on the NES, to the new game that's launching in a few months, Echoes of Wisdom. If you guys have been watching me play through all of these games, hey, thanks for sticking around. This is a really fun thing to do, and surprisingly enough, I wasn't even really burnt out by the end of things, so I hope you'll stick around and see what I have cooking up next for you guys. Well, that's all the time I have for you guys today. Thank you for watching. What was your favorite memory of Grand Theft Auto Online? Please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below, and hey, if you enjoyed today's video, maybe consider giving a like and subscribing. Thank you guys again. I'll catch you in the next video.